Live. Hello, everybody. Welcome to The Secret History Living in Your Aquarium, the longest title of a channel on FishTube. But today we have a very special guest, Miss, wait, this way, this way, uh, Rachel O'Leary. Uh, hello. Hello. And welcome. Thank you Thank so you. much for uh, joining us today. Um, you know, I've been a big fan a long time of uh, your content and uh, hello. your book. Uh, I know you have a couple books, so yeah. But um, nano fish are also kind of my big passion uh, right off the bat. And uh, living in Seattle in an apartment for years, uh, by necessity, they were my uh, my passion. But I I'm curious, what what drew you initially to the little fish? Honestly, fish were super secondary for me. My first passion was snails. Um, okay. <laughs> it sounds ridiculous, but I got super into mystery snails. And in the early 2000s, uh, you couldn't really get much um, for little fish. And I, I started with a community aquarium in my living room that my kids got me for my first Mother's Day. I mean, I'd kept fish before that, but as an sure. adult, that was the first tank that I intentionally got. And I got mystery snails, so I hopped on my dial-up internet and was like looking up information as nerds do. And I learned through applesnail.net about uh, the various genetic heritability traits of apple snails and got really intrigued about trying to line breed these various foot colors with shell colors to get um, some of the really recessive traits. And because of that, I quickly grew to many aquariums, all full of snails. Um, and I wanted something to add to those aquariums that had a little more, um, mid-water activity and stuff. And that's actually how I was introduced to shrimp in 2004. And okay. because of shrimp uh, and my breeding success with shrimp, I put an open call out to exporters then to send me any fish, no matter what it looked like, even if it was like a junk fish that would stay under like an inch and a half. It was my criteria for me okay. to combine with those things with the thought process being that these little tiny fish would not nip the antenna of my snails nor eat my shrimp. And it all sort of snowballed from there. Nice. You know, it's kind of interesting because I remember, you know, I've been in the hobby since I was, well, really around 11 or 12 is when I started breeding for, um, I guess you'd call it profit, but um, it was really before the internet was that useful. I mean, the internet existed, obviously, but that that's, you know, late 90s. So um, mid and late 90s, I guess, when I got interested. But I was interested in the guppies uh, and specifically purple snake skin um, delta tails, like which were all kind of newer traits at the time uh, to get that metallic purple and then the, the lace and snake skin in that big delta tail or in interesting tails. But um, it's interesting the, what I wanted to talk about today is, you know, I figure a lot of people can see your videos and kind of find out your history and, and who you are. And obviously you've got a website, um, your YouTube channel, uh, books and things you've published and you speak all over. Um, but I wanted to kind of touch on maybe some stuff if, if it hasn't been covered of kind of, you know, just like you were saying, like how you found snails first online. So when you were first in getting into the hobby as an adult, I guess, um, were there internet resources that you reached out to or did you uh, go to, you know, I remember indexes in, in um, hobbyist magazines and like mailing lists that you'd get and it'd be a name of like 30 guys, you know, usually like old cranky guys, you know, that you'd write a P.O. Always box old cranky whatever. guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but I was just kind of curious, like how that went when you, when you first got into it, like how did you orient yourself and what did that, what did that, uh, ecosystem or, or, or what did society kind of look like? What did the hobby look like uh, at that point in time? And like roughly what year would you say like 2003 or four, you were saying probably? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so for, so for me, I got started with online forums. Um, this was before Facebook 
This was yeah. certainly before any of the other social medias. Um, I, I, as I mentioned, had dial up internet at that time. Um, wow. So it was a labor of love to access information. But I spent a lot of time on the Monster Aquaria network, which was AquariaCentral.com, MonsterFishKeepers.com, and they had AquaticPhotography.com, all of which interested me in different for different reasons, I, I also keep monster fish. Um, and shortly after becoming a part of that community, I became part of the admin of that community. And I've worked really closely over the years with uh, the owner, Lee or Neo Prodigy, as he's known online. Um, and he's actually the one that probably within a year or so of me becoming active in those communities got me started with aquarium societies. And I really thank him for that because aquarium societies, especially in the early 2000s, changed my life. I had this, this network of other humans that totally understood how encompassing this hobby was for me. And it was an opportunity to be social and share fish and join in on group buys and share knowledge and see speakers. And for me, seeing speakers was the biggest thing. Like you could go to your club, it cost you $20 a year and you could go every month and, yeah. and see another speaker that would turn you on to an entire new niche of this hobby. And, you know, I think it's something that, um, isn't as popular as it used to be, especially with the younger crowd. But I think it's something that everyone should consider simply because like, you know, it's one thing to watch a YouTube video and um, take information, but anyone, anyone can make a YouTube video um, yeah. if we're being honest at a club, like these are generally people that are either doing scientific research or they're doing specified breeding or they're doing classifications or they're doing just like super like high level nerd stuff. So you can get really great concentrated information within a couple of hours and then digest that information and share it with your friends. And I, I, I don't think that um, social media will ever really replace that experience. So I hope that everyone would give that a shot if it's available in their area. Something yeah. Something I feel really funny about. I, I, you know, I, I mean, because of, uh, you know, the, the virus and everything, it's been kind of shut down and it's been a bummer because for me, uh, for, for a lot of years, I mean, I was on, a pretty tight budget in the hobby, you know, DIY fish keeping basically. Uh, but you know, when people would come, I'd save up my money, like, you know, Gary Lang or Eric Thomas, like with rainbow fish, er uh, Gary Lang and Eric Thomas with Cory Dora's. Uh, but you know, people like that, they'd come through. And a lot of times when they come to speak, uh, as you know, they bring, uh, eggs or they bring fish. fry. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And sometimes it's stuff, that you can't get locally, you know. I'm fortunate enough to live in Seattle. The metro area has four million people in it now, so it's you know it, it's got a lot of access to all sorts of things if if you look. But uh, I know a lot of the country and a lot of parts of the world that's just not the case. So what you're saying about joining the local clubs and keeping up to date, or even traveling if you have to to go see one, you know, on a weekend or whatever, it's so worth it. So. It's yeah. funny that you mentioned that because I was actually talking to a buddy on the phone tonight and he asked, like, what's the population where you live? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> and I Googled like my township, which is my greater area, and it's 8,000 people. My particular oh, wow. town, my particular town was less than 2,000. So I come from a very small area. Wow. But yeah. Being on the East Coast, I can drive two hours in pretty much any direction. And when it's not COVID times, I can hit up an aquarium event or club pretty much like two or three times a week. So I'm very fortunate in that regard. Um, and most clubs, I will say, are doing virtual meetings, which is not at all the same thing, but it's a noble effort to, to keep your availability open. And a lot of them are waiving membership fees during this time. Yeah. So, 
it's something to consider. And if you're looking for a club, the best thing you can do is Google your town name and aquarium society. And you'd be surprised what's out there. Some of them are small, you know, maybe 30 or 40 people. And some of them are big four or 500 people. Um, right. But it's a great way, like, especially once you get a bit more enmeshed in the hobby and you're actually breeding things to have a way to share your fry or get new species. For sure. Um, I see a super chat here from uh, Danikin. That's uh, Kenny and Danny have a channel. And what's up, guys? Uh, so it looks like their question is, uh, I missed Rachel when she spoke uh, over at GPAS. Uh, any chances she'll be back in the Portland area asking for a friend? Uh. I do plan to come back to Portland. It wasn't specifically to speak at the Aquarium Society. I have selfish reasons. I'm a backpacker, sure. a kayaker, and a canoer. Oh, man, uh, perfect so place I to go. I hit the uh, Pacific Northwest this year um, just for those selfish reasons. But I'm sure maybe, I mean, if, if depending on what is going on with COVID and um how things work. Maybe we could set up some sort of like public meet and greet or something. I know that there would be an interest. I have a lot of friends and stuff in Portland, many, many, many fish keepers uh, yeah. as well as Seattle. So I'd be yeah. interested in doing that. It's just generally when I go out in the world these days, I don't encounter anyone else. <laughs> I'm just out in nature. Yeah. So we'd have to see what the logistics look like for that. Yeah, well, Washington is an incredible place for nature, and so is Oregon and Northern California, Idaho. Um, the San Juan Islands are definitely another spot that you got to check out if you come up here. Um, I was going to say that that's another thing that I'd like to kind of ask you about is lately, I when I was a kid, I really liked native fish because they were free. I could catch them locally in a stream or whatever and then put them in a tank, and usually I'd kill them because it'd be the dead of summer and I was you know a kid not knowing what I was doing and you know seven or eight years old um but as time goes on you know uh, I kept other fish and then I just thought because of I don't know whatever reason reasons uh not enough information I guess that it was just too hard to keep cold water native fish you know um so I was just curious you know I've been get, looking at and just really falling back in love with like darters shiners things like that so um have you worked with a lot of those native um you know native to the u.s uh kind of to that subtropical or even like temperate um species have you worked with many of them i have but i think it's really important to mention that the legality varies greatly from state to state and area to area about what you can actually legally collect Sure. So in Pennsylvania, it is not legal for me to collect fish. In a lot of oh, the really? southern states, it is not legal to collect fish unless you have an academic permit. So no. one of the reasons I don't talk about that a whole lot on my channel is that I am apprehensive about um, encouraging people to do something that could have questionable legality in their area. Uh, there sure. are massive quantities of really amazing darters and shiners and all kinds of fish available in our U.S. waterways. But a lot of those fish are protected or the waterways are protected. Um, so it's kind of a slippery slope. And there's quite a few different aquaculture um, companies that yeah. will sell these fish if you're interested in working with them. One of my favorites is Saks Aquaculture down in Florida. And that's mainly um, um, pygmy sunfish, some of the shiners, some of the topsiders. Uh, they, have a, they have a really great array that they work with there where they have the, the paperwork in place to be able to collect, then breed, then sell these fish. But I do think that one of the biggest responsibilities we have as hobbyists is being aware of the legality around what we're doing. And it's a very slippery slope to say, the fish are cool in my creek, I'm gonna go keep them and put them in my, my tank without knowing exactly <laughs> if yeah, you're allowed to do that. For sure. 
There's a oh, lot yeah. of protections in place and for good reason. I mean, if sure. you look at fish collecting around the world, like there's so many devastating things happen to our waterways um, that need our awareness. And I don't want to start like a stampede to the local creeks that <laughs> will cause yeah. a problem. No, and, and that's totally understandable. Plus, I mean, invasive species too. And I mean, there's all sorts of things that our hobby already kind of has on its back as, uh, yeah. um, you know, issues. Uh, um, I work uh, kind of the only company I really like have a partnered with, with, you know, YouTube or the channel is aquatic arts and they've started getting into the elosomas and the rainbow shiners and um, that kind of stuff. And so I've been really pushing for, you know, a source to get those, I, like you said, sacks and then uh, uh, jo uh, Jonah's uh, aquatics, I guess, down in is it Georgia or South Carolina, something like that. Um, but yeah, it, that that's just one that interests me since they're in our own backyard. But the other one that uh, recently, like I'm just obsessed with, is um, the Thai or uh, Taiwanese micro dragon goby. Um, that little guy is, you know, it, it can live in 55, 60 degree water, and it's just they're, they're so fascinating. And um, I guess it's just kind of reopened my mind to to just think like. Well, if, if we are closed off, like COVID kind of showed that too, you know, how, how quickly imports can get shifted or shut down. Um, so I, I'm just trying to keep my horizons open too and uh, see what else is out there in the non-heated world too. I, I feel like um, I haven't been able to find like a, a list of um, good, you know, tubbing or non-heated species. So specifically that are nano and that kind of temperate or cool water. Uh, do you have some favorites other than maybe like, I mean, a lot of people know about the meteor minnows or um, uh, I guess uh, least killifish and elosoma, but are there any kind of oddball little ones that you'd recommend at all for kind of that cool water? Well, one thing that I'd like to mention that is relevant with a lot of the temperate species in particular yeah. is that I think one of the main reasons that they're not commonly offered for aquariums is that these are species that similar to like the carnivorous plants I work with, they have a cool down period and they have a very specific um, atmospheric change that occurs uh, throughout different seasons in the year that make them come into breeding dress or that make them spawn or that make them color up. And quite a lot of them look very unimpressive for sure, a lot yeah. of the year and they require they require a seasonal shift for you to really for you to really see their their best if you will yeah. um so for me in my fish room um i i, I really liked keeping johnny darters those were super uh -huh. rewarding you had to feed them uh live food and they were gray boring fish except for when they weren't then yeah I know rainbow and shiners are another one. A lot one of the either. shiners now. Shiners are a lot easier, especially the more temperate ones, the ones that are like subtropical, because yeah. you can do a cold water change or a warm water change, and you can get them to fire up and go crazy. But as far as nanos, um, I don't really have any like super incredible things to unlock for you. Um, as far as what to recommend, the elisomas, sure. all those pygmy sunfish are super cool. Yeah. Again, they are deceptively aggressive. Uh, they yeah. are not that easy to keep. They like their live food. You need to give them more space than you would consider. Um, and but they're they're completely worthwhile if if you're into into supplying what they need. I mean, they're super fun. Yeah. There's you know, tiger teddies, there's the least killies, there's a bunch of cool live bears, um, you know, but as far as US natives, you know, I wish that I would have delved more, but legality has me. Sure. Yeah, there's a lot of the amazing, you know, green, you know, green-sided darters or orange-throated darters, candy cane darters. Yes. Uh, that are just like you look at them and you're like, that's from a tropical reef. It's got to be, you know, and then, oh, no, it's a, it's a three inch fish from Minnesota or, you know, whatever, Ohio. Right. 
Uh, so I, that, that's something that recently I've been just, even if it's just going out, not bringing them back, but going out, it's, um, something that other than game fish, I just wasn't aware of the diversity in the U S waters. And so it's something that, that I was kind of starting to appreciate more. And so I, I was wondering why is it that we haven't seen a big, you know, uh, opening up of that but you make some really like thank you for making those points about you know collecting them and then the seasonality and the live food all that stuff makes for a kind of a hard fish to care for especially i think a lot of people in the hobby are, are getting into it or they learn a certain amount they're not obsessed like some of us are you know they, they want their community tank and that's probably good enough for them so well, and, and one thing I will mention to those of you that are really interested in going that route, nanfa.org, N-A-N-F-A, the North American whatever. Native Fish, yeah. Native Fish Association, invaluable resource. If you're looking for information on fish in your area, if you're looking for information on like the, the legality of collecting. It's an exceptional resource. They do an annual event too. I've never gone, but I hope to sometime. Um, but they, they are really the best resource. And one thing that we can all do, no matter where we live, is go out and look at our local waterways and yeah. enjoy it. You can have a snorkel. You can stick your face in there. You can take massive inspiration and one of the new video series that I want to do is as I travel around I really want to spend a lot of time um, poking into local waterways looking for inspiration because even if we can't get to India or Taiwan or South America or wherever you can learn a whole lot about husbandry and fish just from looking where you are and seeing about the interplay between the floor, the fauna, the water, the movement, the dilution, like all of that. And I think it's a an obvious but really invaluable resource that we often just don't take advantage of. So that's something that I really want to showcase more in the next year on my channel is sort of my awesome. adventures of of understanding nature better, being a better naturalist, like paying attention and understanding why things work based on what I see. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's interesting that you say that because that's something that I, I don't know why, but it's something that uh, I've noticed older keepers, like, you know, 60, 70 year olds that have been doing it since they were kids. Um, it's definitely a key part of the hobby to them uh, when they travel anywhere, you know, even if they're going on a business trip or whatever, like that's part of why they're going to, what they're going to do when they get there. And um, I've done a couple videos on my channel too, of looking at like an, a local bog and just the point of like, wow, there's a lot of natural filtration compared to a tank. And there's a lot of, you know, algae zone and then clear zone. Like there's just, um, you know, things you wouldn't think about that, that really change the behavior or, you know, you see videos of, oh, there's 10,000 corridors together. Maybe three isn't quite enough to bring out the behavior of a group, you know? On that note, one of my favorite videos on YouTube, and I have no idea who did it or even what the title is, is about wild collecting Otosynclus. And yeah. it's when someone grabs them and there's they go like this and they literally pull up thousands of is it the, ga in the gal with the street. basket and she's like sorting yeah them. yeah and it's just like, yeah and i'm like this is why odos don't do well in our tanks like you need a lot of them like <laughs> yeah this is how they're supposed to be like they ah uh. yeah no it's it's interesting too how um price dictates that and i mean and how hard it is to breed in captivity odos are, i guess odos are a they're well, cheap. Though. <laughs> maybe I shouldn't expose the aquarium trade, but they're a no, three. Go for it. They're a three cent fish. You have to buy them in groups of six hundred to twelve hundred. Yeah, they are literally a three cent fish. There is absolutely no reason in the United States, at least, that they are expensive. Other than the fact that they are packed so densely, they come in poorly and they're starving, and people don't know how to handle them upon import. They were one of my best sellers. I don't I don't really sell fish that much anymore, but when I did, 
They yeah. were one of my best sellers and it's because I knew how to bring them in, fatten them up, make them healthy. And then they did well, they didn't die. And so, uh, I think it's a great disservice. So that on that note, I, yeah, on that note, I was just curious. Um, so with fish like that, like the uh, otocinclus or for instance, like siphodons or something, they eat a lot of biofilm, a lot of algae. Do you have recommendations for, I mean, because I see a lot of times I love them and I like to promote that people keep them, but at the same time, I don't want people to keep them if they don't understand that you need an age tank for some of those species and you need like a whole ecosystem of little zooplankton and, you know, micro crustaceans and things for them to, to survive and thrive. Uh, but do you have any recommendations as far as that goes? Like if people are trying to keep any of those algae kind of loving species in I numbers? The off walks lovers, the, the ones that graze yeah. on the algae and the micro crustaceans, Rapashi superfoods. Um, I helped way back in the day. I was involved on the development of this project, this product. Oh, cool. Um, it's, it's all Alan Rapashi's thing, but I did beta testing and gave input and developed a few diets with him and Soylent Green which yep. is a hilarious name, yeah. was my favorite. And I still think it is unsurpassed as far as an off walks replacement. And what I like to do with that specifically is apply it to driftwood. And then okay. like I keep little sticks and then I apply the um, soil and green to it and I wrap them with cellophane and I put them in my refrigerator or my freezer and then I just switch them out into the tank in a specific spot so that the grazers can graze. And when I was importing fish and I was bringing in, you know, hundreds or thousands of fish, yeah. I would even lower the water line and just sprinkle the powder on all the surfaces. And then the fish could just literally sit and vibrate and digest without even having to expend any energy trying to see seek their nutrition source. And that seemed to work really, really well. It was very messy. It meant daily water changes. Sure. It's not recommended for the average hobbyist, but as a, um, a person, if you're bringing those fish in, that's what worked really well. Uh, you can also certainly, you know, make it in the cubes or whatever. But I found the delivery method of applying it to to pieces of wood and things like that was the best way for them to uh, to actually graze, ingest yeah. the food, and get the nutrition they need. I also firmly believe in the use of botanicals and natural elements within an aquarium: leaf litter, pods, all those things that. Um, harbor the growth of paramecium's and secondary life forms uh, through their natural breakdown, which for a lot of those species is, is just like, if you look at underwater footage of where these fish are from, all you see is pods and leaf litter and like oh, fuzzy yeah. branching. They need that. So if you're gonna put them especially into an aquarium that's a little bit newer, you need to make sure that you're supplementing with, um, some other natural elements that they can graze on because the vast majority of these species have really, really long digestive tracts, which means yeah. they eat constantly because for them to get the available nutrition, they have to eat all the time before it's yeah. processed. So just feeding them, a, you know, a couple times a day or once a day is not going to be adequate for them to have longevity. Um, so uh, pardon my cat. Oh, no, that's great. I love cats. Yeah. Um, so that's great. Tip. For their Thank longevity, you. It's, it's best to. They always do that. That's, it's not a cat yes. if it doesn't do that. That's my editor. So blame oh, okay. her for the mistakes in my videos. <laughs> um, anyway, like I like to add a lot of the botanicals or leaf litter or things like that that are like a renewable thing to the aquarium that fish can graze on naturally in between feedings and yeah. that harbor the growth of all these microorganisms that they would naturally encounter. And then that way they seem to thrive much more. And it seems to be really good for their gut health as well. Yeah. You know, that, that was another thing that I've noticed with um, like micro predators or just predatory fish in general. I just have more experience with um, you know, as a teenager, I had some uh, Oscars and things that teenage boys tend to gravitate towards, I guess, like, 
you know, any sort of, you know, it, well, we couldn't get a piranha, so we better get something, you know, as close, as mean as we can until that time. But no, now I really like the little micro predators, but I, I you know, I realized that they get fatty liver uh, disease and, and like constipation and stomach binding issues, things like that. If they're not eating little critters that have the spirulina or the algae in them. So they may be just carnivores, but even just carnivores are consuming, you know, a vegetative or, or food even in the some exoskeletons way. of, sure. of microcrustaceans, things like that, that clean out their gut health. Yeah. Um, you know, like and that's one of my biggest, my biggest complaints about a lot of the formulated fish foods is that they don't, they don't necessarily really mimic what the gut contents are and things have come a long way in the past yeah. 10 years. I mean, there is such a vast improvement in the fish foods available. And let's be real, like the aquarium hobby has been around forever yeah. and fish have been going on forever. And the people that are now in their eighties or nineties or whatever that were breeding fish were using commercially produced foods, but they were also, supplementing with a ton of live cultures and other things that really, really encouraged the breeding behavior as well as the gut health. Um, also, back then, they weren't using nearly the medications that we throw yeah. at our aquariums, which I think is another giant problem, you know. So yeah. I think that you know, at the end of the day, if we scale back and and sort of like Take it to the keep it simple, stupid method where yeah. if you provide clean water, you provide the best quality food that you can and mimic an environment as best you can that will suit the fish, you're, you're going to have success. Totally. Yeah. No, that's I mean, I think, like you said, keep it simple, stupid, looking at nature, obviously. I mean, people will, will so often the question they have when, when they leave messages or message me is like, you know, how do I get rid of algae? And I'm like, why do you want to get rid of the algae? Like, like, I mean, like I get if it's blooming all over and it's black beard algae, but a little bit of just, you know, diatome algae on hey, the rock. I front, resent you know? that. I like, <laughs> I, I love your algae tank. I love your algae tank. I have to say. Um, and you know, actually I take, I took the, the Marmo moss balls, rip those up and just let them coat everything in a few of my tanks and I, I mean shrimp love it and stuff um but something else i wanted to kind of point out was you know as kind of uh the hippie historian of fish that i try to be on here um it's actually amazing that like neocaridina uh david eye or zangagensis whichever species you want to say they kind of kept it a little proprietary what was going on you know at first but the cherry shrimp and blue dream shrimp it, it was the uh, Christmas of 2003 that Petco and PetSmart brought in like, you know, a few million or whatever, 100,000 of them for all their stores. And it, yes, there were hobbyists who had things like that before. But I think a lot of people who, who are getting into the hobby don't realize that shrimp and things like that, as well as other, you know, fish and things, we've only had them in the hobby for 25, 30 years and we've come not this far with, long. yeah, not exactly. That long. Yeah, not in the like, mainstream hobby at all, for sure. No, yeah. I would say mainstream hobby, arguably, arguably the past 10 years. Yeah, um, so, so that, that was my question is, what have you seen change? You know, what, where did it start? Um, if you could, let, let's just talk about shrimp for the heck of it. Um, you know, what did you see first? And, and you remember starting and then, um, what if you, what, where do you see it now or what do you enjoy keeping now? You know, um, it's available. Oh boy. That's <laughs> Sorry. <kind of weird. laughs> no. Uh, so I, I got my first shrimp in early 2004, I think, and they yeah, were not available in stores at that point. Um, not anywhere that I knew of and not with anyone that I knew about. And that was as part of a hundred thousand plus community, um, yeah. On the internet, uh, you had to buy them from other hobbyists. I remember CPOs and tangerine shrimp, I think, were, or, were, or tangerine tigers, I think, were the only ones I really remember well, back. Tangerine then. tigers are a wild shrimp, and they're still, they're still cool as shit. Um, yeah, yeah. But they're, no, they're still really fantastic. 
Uh, but cherry shrimp, I got my first one, and I still have the colony going today, um, wow. 17 years later. Uh, wow. I remember them coming in and just like seeing like all the the questions people had and and uh, watching us learn about how they breed and what they can go with. And it was it was super exciting. It was super exciting time. And I got those. And then I got red railies, then I got yellows. Uh, about two years later, blues became available. Um, oh. Then I got oranges, orange railies. Uh, then I developed a um, blue body red really line. So the funny thing about like the really shrimp was like we spent, you know, maybe four or five years like perfecting these grades of these like super opaque body solid colored shrimp and then like all of a sudden people wanted to make the the cheaper shrimp resemble the the crystals so they started breeding the clear patches into them and like i remember back in the day being like are you kidding me like we just spent five years getting these to a level where they can be graded and now we're putting clear patches back in them like it was it was nuts it was nuts at the time but I also see why, and I, I, I keep them, and I participated in that trend, and, you know, whatever. Um, my biggest issue, I think, with the shrimp hobby is that because it's become so popular, um, the demand is much higher, and that's awesome. Fully support that. The problem is, is that the fish or the shrimp being shipped in from overseas are now being pond reared as opposed to tank reared, which means they're coming in with disease. Ella biopsidae, like stuff like that that's happened over the last few years. Yeah. Yeah. And to me, that's that's like a, a money grab and it's not cool, man. Like, I don't know about you, but I would much rather pay like a dollar more shrimp to make sure it's not sick and yeah. not going to ruin my entire colony than like buy cheap shrimp. Um, my yeah. other issue is that I think uh, specifically with the Caridina species, there's so many really cool species that exist in the wild, um, most of which come from critically threatened habitats that are being rampantly destroyed through palm oil production, yeah. gold mining, agriculture, yeah. like whatever. And the the biggest focus, at least in the glamour side of the hobby, has been on the hybridization and production of like one off really cool shrimp and i think the focus should be on pre preserving those original species first and foremost and um, yeah. unfortunately yeah. for shrimp keepers uh in cichlids you know cichlids get some money and some press and publication and research for their preservation but shrimp don't seem to be getting the same thing and i think that's really sad yeah, so, yeah. Because of those reasons, I have sort of um, stepped back from the shrimp hobby, despite it it being like really my primary love, uh, simply because I feel a great responsibility to not promote things um, if I'm not entirely sure they're completely ethical. So that's super. I still keep a lot of shrimp. Um, I will always keep shrimp. I shrimp pimp at heart. Um, but I just really don't want to further, um, un until there is some sort of protections in place to preserve species. And I actually sent off a bunch of specimens to the University of Florida for classification for the Iliobiopsidae, which has a new classification. Um, and they have, um, figured out what that is and they're working on the treatment protocol now but until there is like a true treatment and whatever i, I really just can't support the import of those species um yeah just, well that's like I'm, I'm one of those girls that puts your money where your mouth is like this sweater is made out of recycled plastic i don't shop at certain stores like you know, I try and grow my food. Maybe I'm a little crunchy. Maybe I'm a little punk rock. I don't know. But I, I try very hard to put my money where my mouth is and throw my support where it does 
the most for the things that I care about. And until the shrimp hobby gets cleaned up a bit, I just am not sure that I can throw my support there right now. Well, I think that that's an awesome, I mean, that's an awesome point. Um, thank you, you know, for bringing that up. And I think that a lot of people just don't know. I mean, that's not information. Well, of course they that, don't. Why would yeah, they? Yeah, you yeah. Know? It's not financially, uh, uh, you know, it's not a good idea for the, the stores or for importers, for most people in the chain to be, you know, saying those things right now even if they may be true, you know, same with a uh, boost of philandra being harvested from old growth. Creeks oh, don't and even like that. get me so, <laughs> started. I know it's bad. It's bad. Plant. Yeah. Um, but um, you know, and uh, at AGA, at least this last, this last year when they happened to be in Seattle. So I got to go um, was the first time that they said that they needed to see where the boost was from and they weren't going to allow just the rhizome clumps. That's you know, not true. Really? Well, because that's what they told us. In DC, in whatever the year AGA was in DC, they asked for authenticity before that. Now, I don't know if they followed through. Uh -huh. Then it was in Denver after that, and I was there for that one as well. I spoke at both of those. Um, yeah. And one of the things, and in fact, at the, the Denver one, um, Gazanfar Gori gave a presentation on Bucephalandra and talked about the importance of buying cultured and looking yeah. for authenticity. So whether or not they, they followed through on yeah. who their vendors are, it certainly raised awareness about the, the, the huge issue of wild harvest harvesting of these plants. For sure. I just happen to know they kicked three vendors out that year in Seattle. Hell yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I was I'm impressed. Glad to hear it. Yeah. And it was, I mean, it, I'm not, I won't say who it is because, you know, whatever, but the, sh the it was a shrimp vendor, you know, that, that wasn't even, Boost wasn't even their main thing. Um, they were just kind of using AGA, I think. Well, here's the thing, man. Either. I get hit up on, on Facebook Messenger like five times a day saying, I'll send you, I'll sell you a these. A kilo products. of. Philandra, yeah, you know, two hundred dollars, and like I'm like, <laughs> they are clearly ripped from the wild, where yeah. they need not be ripped from the wild. They are not that hard to grow under greenhouse conditions. Yeah. Like, just freaking grow them. Give them your yeah. own freaking trade name. Call them brownie. Call them like <laughs> purple point magic unicorn. I they don't just care. Just make names up, anyways, you know? don't they? Let, let's get let's Ugh. get that clear. What's your opinion on that? What's with the names in Boost? There are a billion names. They just just like pot. They just make it up. I you know it's the same with fish. That's why sure. I always go with the Latin. You yeah. know, and unfortunately though, with a lot of fish and a lot of plants, they haven't been formally described. And yeah. depending on where they're being grown or where the fish are from, they can have slightly different looks from other spots. So. Yeah. You know, unless you get down to the like nuts and bolts of doing, you know, the sequencing, it yeah. can be difficult to know if you have a new species or not. So I'm so excited for a You won't go or, that I'm, hard into the nerd. Yeah. I mean, I'm so excited for the day when you can run a DNA sample on your phone, you know, with like a little e reader thing or something. I mean, wouldn't that be cool? Yeah. It's funny that you say that because I just entered into, I, I don't do any formal sponsorships on my channel. Mm -hmm. Nobody paid me anything. Yeah, me neither. Um, I, I think it, it for me, um, it takes away from my authenticity. But I did reach out to API recently. And, you know, API is who makes like the master test oh, kit. Yeah. It's like the best test kit ever. Yeah. They have a digital one now. And I'm going to oh. have a video coming out on it soon. And it's not available for the average consumer. But where it is available is for our stores or anyone who has a retail license. And it's going to okay. be freaking bonkers to take that thing out into the field and, like, test the different water parameters oh, yeah. and do all that yeah. kind of stuff. I'm really excited. It's sitting on my coffee table right now. Oh, I'm that's pretty awesome. stoked about it. Like, nice. I'm not going to lie. It'll be neat. And 
Again, I mean, this is technology that's been around for over a decade in the pool sure. industry, but I'm hoping that it's going to trickle down to the hobbyist industry because it removes all of that, like, what color is this? Did I shake oh. it enough? Have yeah. I waited long enough? It's like is it a old, digital expired. that you're like, boop, 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 boop. It's going to yeah. be sweet, man. That's awesome. Yeah, like I mean, cash strips on steroids. You know, uh, I think it was Heiko Blair had like some version of almost a mass spectrometer type thing that gave him That's a readout. What this is. Yeah, it gave him a readout of like the elemental breakdown of the water in like Borneo when he was there. And he was like, oh, That's I don't want to drop is. this. <laughs> I don't want to drop this. It's $40,000. But, you know, this is obviously some university technology that he had. But right. um Someday I bet it'll be cheap enough for us all to have, and that'll be pretty oh, cool. I would imagine within a few years it, it yeah. will be right there. Yeah. I, I'm sorry. No, it's okay, cats. That's that's what they do. That's what they're for. I mean, you got to have your fish. You go to your fish. Your cats come to you sometimes. <laughs> um, the other thing uh, that I was thinking about um, in the hobby, you know, is currently uh, I like to I like to look at uh social and economic and political reasons uh for things uh, you know the, the, okay let me just take a step back i'm getting convoluted but basically the, when i started my channel uh about five years ago i started as a personal journal and then i decided i was going to be looking at the world if i was stuck in a fishbowl and the only contact with the world was whatever products came in there but i was allowed to trace back to China, that's where the plastic was molded, or you know, the metal was mined for the impeller on the uh, filter that made by Fluval, and that came out of the Congo or the Central African Republic. You know, what sort of issues, what sort of uh, stories would would we end up with looking at that and breaking that down? So it's kind of on the same spectrum of a lot of what you do and what you inspired me to kind of get into. Um, but right now, for instance, in Myanmar, formerly Burma, sometimes still called Burma, um, you know, they're having a big political uh, government coup and then now killing demonstrators in the streets. I think we're at near 700 officially killed. In the, and officially. I mean, this officially. is what they're allowing us to know. Probably thousands. Um, yeah. I, I don't want to get too political. No, no, I understand that. But, um, you know, so what I was going to say is um, on my radar, I know, for instance, um, Liberia, we get a lot of um, a lot of killifish and things like that from from that area. And that's an area that's notoriously unstable. Um, the Central African Republic, Sudan and Congo, there are a lot of really cool fish. You know, for instance, um, puffers are a big one that we kind of think of in the hobby and a moneymaker, kind of a flagship species maybe for the area. Uh, but yet again, sometimes it's too dangerous and you'll hear that the importers are like, yeah, I don't really want to go, you know, upriver well, for I mean, that's, that, that's, you know? that's legit. And yeah. here's something that a lot of people don't really think about when it comes to the exportation of freshwater fish is that you have to think about where the airports are, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So like even, even in, let's say Peru, Mm -hmm. Um, you think, oh, well, I want to fish out of Peru. And you think of Peru as like this dot on the map. But yeah. the reality is, is that it's an entire country. And what you're dealing with when you're trying to get fish out of a specific waterway is not only does someone have to go to that waterway, collect that fish, they have to travel back with that fish, hold that fish, and then go through the export process before it can go. So... In a lot of these, um, especially in a lot of the African countries, like yeah. the logistics of getting to that waterway where there aren't roads yeah. or whatever, and then getting back with that fish. The reason those fish are so expensive is because like it is bonkers hard. It's not like, you, yeah. you know, they're jumping in their Jeep and driving it to the airport you know, they've got to like yeah. navigate these areas to get the fish out. Well, yeah. I mean, it, my favorite biotope. So as we discussed earlier, I love biotopes. I love setting up tanks that kind of look like, you know, what they're supposed to do in the wild. 
Um, but uh, the Shan River Basin uh, and, and then Lake Inlay and the Wa State. Oh, which, yeah. Yeah, which, you know, Inlay, uh, someday I hope to go there. But uh, it wasn't really open to the West, if you want to call it that, you know, uh, Europe, America and, and right. uh, Japan. Well, it's not like a, it's not like a tourist destination. It's it's the, yeah. a local place. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, they're trying to kind of make it one on the lake now. Um, uh, surprisingly, they're trying to package the whole like, come see the pagodas and the Buddhas and come to the lake. But it's hard to sell that when it's like, well, yeah, but 10 years ago, it was like guys with kalashnikovs and the opium trade and you know was that that was other than afghanistan that's the heart of it you know um but uh that area i mean it, it wasn't until 2006 that celestial pearl daniels were even you know explained it taxonomically uh and we you've got the the orange rummy nose rasboras and a lot of the uh, splendens yeah, yeah the so there's a bunch yeah. of hovering loaches from there too that are yeah. really cool yeah i just you know and i love a lot of those animals um you know basically all the way up to where you find like the panda loaches uh in china and yunnan province down into kind of the Malay peninsula and thailand there's just so much diversity that we have not seen still because like you said it's so hard to get the fish out of there and things so it's, it's not even that it's hard to get the fish. It's that the fish don't have value. What has value in a lot of those areas is things that make more money. Sure. Or edible fish, you know? Yeah. You know, I talked to I mean, a guy in the, in the waterways that our little tiny guys are coming from, from the most part, it's not edible fish. It's that right. the, the land area is more valuable for other resources than collecting fish because I'm sorry for all of those who are delusional out there, but nano fish don't make the money for the exporters. No. They, yeah, they just yeah. don't, you know, they don't, they're, they're cheap yeah. fish. Uh, they have my heart. They have my soul. They have my support from here to the end of time, but they, they don't make the money for, for the exporters. For well, the and this is exactly why I, I'm so happy to have you here is because this is the stuff that doesn't really get, discuss that much and um you know it, it, if you understand the the driving factors and the motives for these things i mean it, a lot of times you've got regions that are so unstable you know food's not a necessity and so what do they care about a lot that says you can't gold mine or you can't do this or that and it may well, be they outside need, they need to survive yeah exactly people so need to survive yeah so it's not necessarily obviously the people at location it's the the trans shippers in the big cities in bangkok or something that exploit those regions yes. or americans buying from them that are the chain or the part of the chain that we can do something about or complain about i guess if, if nothing else well, but i really think the best thing that we can do is purchase from people who give a crap about the fish they're getting in and yeah. i well, tell you right now, I have absolutely no one that I recommend at this time. I haven't been a consumer for a long time. I don't know who's good at the game. Sure. I know that when I was doing it, I took pride in bringing stuff in, quarantining it for a month, feeding yep. it, getting it to a point that like I would want to put it in my own aquarium before I even listed it for sale. And I know that that is not a popular model, nor is so, it yeah. one that is particularly duplicable to make a large profit. But what I will say is that my rate of recidivism, <laughs> like the amount of people that came back to me when I was doing that was huge because you you weren't throwing away your money. Yeah, you may have paid a dollar extra of fish, but your fish lived. And I think right. this is really where the focus and the morals, the values and the ethics of our hobby needs to go. Like don't be cheap. <laughs> yeah. Buy and don't don't be fooled by a price tag either. Don't just buy something cuz it's expensive, but like vet who you're buying from. Anyone who is worth anything will be able to tell you when the fish came in, if they're eating, what they're eating, what they've done in quarantine, if anything, and be able to yeah. tell you how to keep the fish. Yeah. You know, and I think if that standard of 
of care was just established a bit better, it would be better for all of us in the long run. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's even worse with shrimp, um, like you were saying. Oh. You know what I mean? They're so protective. I mean, both overseas a lot of times, uh, you know, where they got the line or whatever, you know, especially if it's something new. Uh, but beyond that, I mean, like – they will, they, they, I know so many times where I've talked to people who are in the business and they're like, a couple shrimp had ilio biops today, but, uh, you know, most of them are fine. So we're going to, I think we're going to roll with this supplier. And I'm like, really? Like, that's okay. You that know? means, you know, <laughs> and so that's, you know, I have the same issue in when people want a recommendation where to get something rare, or hard to find or whatever. And you may be able to find it, but that doesn't mean it's a good source of it, you know? I have to tell you, I stopped recommending sellers years ago. And, you know, even when I was selling fish, I was yeah. happy, like, especially like when I dealt with my customers that were on the left coast, you know, your California, Washington, yep. Oregon, like whatever. I was always happy back in the day to tell them, you know, you could buy this for me, but this other seller is on your same coast, which means the water is going to be more similar. It's yeah. going to be cheaper for you to have it shipped. It's going to be easier transport for your fish, like less risk of delays, buy it from them. Yeah, you know, like sure. I've always been one that is super happy to like pass the buck and be like, get your fish here. It's closer to you because it's better for the fish. Yeah. And I think what is severely lacking from uh, today's day and age in the aquarium hobby is everyone wants it now and they don't necessarily want it best. Yeah. No, I, to I totally me, agree. To me, that's the problem. Yeah. And, and it's same with breed stock and, you know, genetic diversity. And it's, people want a pleco. They want a leopard frog or a zebra pleco. And they want to they wanna pay 30 or 50 bucks for it. And it's like to get a good color from a diverse stream that, you know, as they've used other breeders and they've, you know, switched uh, gene pools and things like, which is hard to find, but someone like Greg says, you know, and you know with, with things like invertebrates, that's unnecessary. Sure. I just wanted yeah. to point out that Ethan Wright just in the chat said that people are, are, or he said how their quarantine can be a big effect. A uh, gunshot approach with antibiotics, et cetera, is yeah. bad. I agree with that 1 million percent. There is absolutely yeah. no reason to medicate a fish unless you know what you're medicating. I have a yeah. microscope in my basement and unless I know what I'm treating, I do not medicate. Yep. Medications are made to kill organisms. This yeah, is not a good life. idea to throw at your tank. There you yeah. go. That's exactly like that is the 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 best advice ever is don't just throw meds. They kill your beneficial bacteria and they kill your fish if you don't know what you're treating. Please. You know, and I did the same thing about algae killing products because that's yeah. just a, a well, cycle. and a lot of them probably have oxygen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um Okay, so I think we're definitely on the same page on a, on a lot of our philosophies on this, which, you know, obviously, because I've learned from you. Um, but uh, what do you see as maybe some trouble spots or blind spots that maybe the average hobbyist who feels fairly, you know, educated on things, but but like, are there some other spots? We've, we've talked about booths, we've talked about really remote locations or um, developing nations and, you know, um, some of the issues with collecting, you know, and or disease and like, for instance, there are some people, I don't think we need to name names, but there's people who, who use like two or three meds, four meds, and just treat everything that comes in for like five days. And that's their quarantine process. And it's like, yeah, it may work, but if anything gets through now, it's resistant for one. Not and even that. So one of my biggest issues with that is, I mean, if you guys don't know what I do is I work with a lot of like uh, specialized grazers. So I work with a lot of like gobies and I work yeah. with a lot of, you know, thinkless like species and ancestral species and catfish species or, or grazers in general. And one of the things that I think um, 
is most important to know about these fish is that like they have a very particular bacteria in their gut that allows them to digest the materials that they eat. You know, they're eating stuff that other fish won't eat. If you hit them with a bunch of antibiotics, it kills the bacteria that makes them able to process the food that they need to live. And that's why a lot of them die. So yeah. I think that, you know, the, the rampant use of meds is, is dangerous on a lot of levels. I mean, I'm not saying there's not a time and a place to use medication. There are a hundred percent is. I'm not saying that it's realistic for people to consult a vet every time. I, I'm not yeah. saying that, but I'm saying don't have it be your immediate response to throw specifically antibiotics at your fish. Yeah. Pick up your husbandry, do daily water changes. Uh, it's a lot of work, but a lot of times that dilution, if you think about where the waterways these fish are coming from, they're from massive dilution. The best thing that you can do to help your fish when they're feeling stressed or sick is increase that dilution because you're reducing the amount of microorganisms or pathogens within the water. Feed them the best quality diet that you can, bolster that immunity, make them as healthy as possible for them to be able to fight it off from a natural standpoint. And if that's not responding, that's when you look under your microscope or consult someone more experienced or make a decision based on like really concrete evidence within your aquarium to choose a medication. Right. You know, that's something that I've kind of Definitely started doing. Definitely box. <laughs> no, no, I really Sorry. appreciate that. Thank you. And the other thing is, you know, I, I've started, I used to have the approach more of trying to figure out what it is right away. But now, you know, if I have a sick fish or two sick fish or something out of 50 in a community tank, I'll literally just put them in their own tank for a while and maybe add catapa leaves and an air stone and make sure that tank gets tons of water changes and just keep them separate. And 70% of the time, probably, they either die that night or they make it and they just need some time. And then after a while, they're, they're okay. And it's just shown me how many times I've medicated stuff when I didn't need to whatsoever. Or the time of doing the medication thing is what, like, it's, it's a placebo effect. So you feel like you're doing something. And sometimes it's not that, it's just a couple days needed to pass. Well, if you think whatever. about stress response, like stress response, no matter how you look at it, like if, oh gosh, hold on, my battery is running low. Oh, sorry, was, yeah. Um, so if you look at the, the stress response, like the cortisol production, like sure. a lot of times if you can bolster the immunity, whether it's humans or fish or, or, or whatever, yeah. Often they will recover from things that aren't um, particularly significant in the grand scheme of things. You know, there there are always exceptions. You know, fish get sick and sometimes need treatment. The fish have yeah. parasites sometimes and need treatment. But very often, even if you need to treat, if you can go through the steps of super clean water and a super good diet before you treat them, you'll have a better result anyway. Yeah, and yeah. that's kind of what I like people to think about, you know, like you want to go into treatment with the best possible scenario, not with a weakened fish. So, yeah, you know, and if you're just like gravel vacuuming and cleaning your tank 24 seven too, it's like, it's not this diverse microorganism rich environment anymore either. You know, if, it, if well, it's, it's more I, of a holding I, tank, I, you know. Well, I, I don't know about that. I mean, I was, I was just saying more like um, dilution and good nutrition goes further than you think. Um, sure. When you're trying sure. to think about like, like how, how these fish survive in the wild. I mean, you figure yeah. if we're getting wild caught fish, they're coming into our aquariums. Like why are they all of a sudden sick? It's right. because they don't have enough dilution and they don't have an adequate diet. Yeah. Well, I just, I just so think sometimes people want to keep a pristine glass little box, you know what I mean? Of, oh of, yeah. And, and so I run into that sometimes and they want uh, an answer in a bottle or a powder or whatever to yeah. fix whatever it may be. And it's like, sometimes the fish you want lives in a mucky coffee colored river, you know? Um, 
and maybe you shouldn't have that fish if, if that's not the, you know, what you like. Um, so yeah, you know, um, well, uh, I don't know how much time you have, um, but, uh, you know, thanks for joining me. Do you, do you have a little longer or are you trying to wrap things up or? Yeah. Do you want to see if anyone in the, the chat has any particular that questions? Can... I sort of went off on my soapbox there. You guys no, got no, like no. legit Rachel O'Leary, like, <laughs> Rah. Well, and I wanted to thank my mods. Thank you guys so much for putting links to Rachel stuff and anything we're talking about that's, you know, um, pertinent and also for all the, you know, great comments that are coming in. But yeah, exactly. That's what I was going to ask if, if, uh, you know, I feel like I've monopolized your time just getting to chat with you and, you know, all these I've people. I've been trying to watch it. I'm not sure. I'm not sure how live the chat is that I'm seeing over here. I see a lot of really familiar, awesome faces, especially some of the women in the chat, which makes me super happy. Yeah, I love, I love the girls on the channel. Like, I mean, that's something that when I started, it was 95% men on my channel. And I was like, what is going on with this? And now the ratios, it, at least it's, it's like 68 to 72% men, but that's a lot better than it was. But I'm like, why can't we just all get along and all, you know, like, what do I do that, you know, I, I want to just make it uh, welcoming to everybody. You know what I mean? And, and some of the, the gals in here are so intelligent and have so much to offer, you know, in the chat. So I love to hear from them, you know, guys it's too. It's funny you how do. humans are smart when you take away their gender. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, let's see here. Um, does anybody have any questions for Rachel? I'm looking at um, the chat live kind of on my screen now too. I know we're getting this kind of like filtered version of it on the yeah, streaming. Yeah, I, I, I was trying to look. Um, let's see. Um, oh, I see one. Uh, Morgan uh, Tribble says, Rachel, I'm, research, I'm a research scientist graduating this month with my MS in biology and you have inspired me to continue my research to benefit the aquarium hobby. Thanks for your constant inspiration. Well, that's nice. Yeah. That's awesome. That's really cool. And good for you. You are yeah. definitely smarter than me. <laughs> uh, another question from passion fruit is, does Rachel still have her colony of wild type? Um, Caradina. Uh, Logue my eyes. Uh, yep. You see the question? Yeah. yeah. No. So I had my knee replaced two years ago and a lot of my more sensitive species just didn't make it through me not being able to be down there for six months. Uh, my family did an amazing job of taking care of my fish room. The vast majority of my tanks uh, did really, really well, but I lost my mystery snails. I lost a couple of shrimp colonies um, and I lost uh, a couple of fish colonies. And, you know, all things considered when I had like a hundred aquariums going to lose like five or six colonies was not that bad, but that is one that I lost. That's kind of heartbreaking. I love that those dudes. That is, I mean, that is a lot of things to take care of. And honestly, yeah. that's impressive that your family managed to do that well. I mean, I, I've gone away for two weeks and told people to, to like keep things in check in like 20 aquariums and come back to like six months a 20% no death rate. Joke, dude. <laughs> six months yeah. was no joke. Also, I want to thank uh, the, the super chats that I've seen come in. And, you know, I appreciate the support for the channel and also go to Rachel's channel, give her some super chats. Um, oh, I see. But, I see one from Jared who's sending me a uh, food calendar, and yes. he asked about uh, keeping micro crabs in a one gallon. Yeah, you can. Um, they are one of the few species that I think are uniquely good for that small of an aquarium. One thing I will say is that I would really recommend you using some sort of directional power head or surface agitation for those guys. I have found that they do really, really the absolute best with a large, well, in a one gallon, I don't know how large it can be, but maybe you could set up like a corner mat and filter that has like the foam 
mm-hmm. base and feeding powdered foods because I have found that their longevity and their ability to be bred is highly dependent on the surface area that they can graze upon. And they will just sit on that sponge and then extend their arms and that the the sort of fibrous hairs on their arms, they'll collect all the powder and they do much, much better. So for them, dilution doesn't really seem to matter if you can keep the tank clean, but definitely give them a big sponge area to encounter if you can for the best. You seem to be the expert on those crabs. I mean, by far, because the info on that is- You know what they say about experts though. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I feel like a lot of info, like right now I'm trying to learn about the the Thai micro uh, dragon. There's not like even the published taxonomy paper, it just gives you the like the water parameters and where they found them. And, and that's and it's like uh, they speculate that they spawn out at sea. <laughs> OK. And this is how this is how Joey convinced me to do YouTube is because he said people want to hear you talk about the nerdy stuff, you know, about fish. And <laughs> there I was you like, go. Yeah. But I'm already speaking and I'm writing books and I'm writing articles and I'm well, we contributing need you. to this and I'm contributing to that. And he's like, but people watch YouTube. And I was like, YouTube? We really? need your blood and soul, you Rachel. Like, YouTube? So, not just your words and paper. Yeah. No, it's it's a great way to, I mean, it's a good format for a lot of people to kind of tune it in is. and get bite, bite-sized information or or later after the fact, you can look back and say, oh, that's what I needed to find out about something. Um, so okay. it says, uh, there's someone else who has a question. And this actually kind of ties back into something else we were talking about. And uh, Regina uh, Valanges says, uh, hey, Alex and Rachel, uh, I have a question about starting a new tank. Can I use a seeded sponge filter from an established tank if the pH and water parameters are really different in both tanks? And All I have to say is if it's a really low pH, you may not have hardly any beneficial bacteria. You may need to rely on water changes if if you're in like really low, like licorice garami territory. But uh, what do you have to say about that, Rachel? I would think in general, the bacteria will be less active in those more acidic environments. But no matter what, adding a seeded filter to a new aquarium is the very best way to jumpstart your aquarium. I would encourage you to, um, I mean, it all depends too on what you're keeping. Uh, One of my favorite products, and again, not sponsored, I'm not sponsored by anybody, um, is Polyfilter, which is made by Polymarine Bio, which is a sheet of um, chemical media that both adsorbs and absorbs. And if you're starting a new aquarium and you're adding seeded media and you're concerned that you may have a cycle, I would encourage you to purchase this. It's maybe 10 bucks and you can cut like a postage stamp size or maybe a little bit bigger and you can either float it in your aquarium or put it in your, um, in your filter. And what it does is it'll change color to show you what it's filtering out. So if you're having a mini cycle that maybe isn't detectable by your test kit, or maybe you're not as diligent with testing as uh, all the internet experts like to tell you to be, it'll turn yellow to show you it's filtering out ammonia. And most importantly, what it does is if you see it have a color change like that, you know that you need to do a water change but it's adsorbing. So that means it's it's pulling that stuff out of the water before it's an issue. And I think that with a newer aquarium, it's really your best line of defense. It's important to mention that this will remove fertilizers or other chemicals that you're adding to your water. But I think that anyone who is setting up a new aquarium really can't go wrong with utilizing this for the first you know, six weeks at least. Um, this technology is what is also used for like kidney dialysis and yeah. water treatment. It is a legit scientific yeah. genius, have, have you, genius media. Have you played with like safety Zorb or any of those like ultra, you know, nah. high surface area, things like that? Okay. Nah. So the thing that my, I've been inundated with the last, let's say six months, two questions. So I'm going to, I'm going to ask a question on behalf of other people, you know, for you Um, is what's your opinion on the anaerobic and anoxic like baskets, the 
Dr. Novak system uh, is, is oh. kind of in all the rage on the internet. So I, I was just curious. He's if, a super if smart dude. Good. Yeah. Have you yeah. ever seen him speak? Oh yeah. 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 He's definitely. a super smart dude. Like mm -hmm. he has some incredible papers about bacteria and I am not nearly smart enough to Very comment special. on his research. Okay. Yeah. No problem. I was just curious if you tried the little. Um, uh, I, I haven't app. needed to try. I've had aquariums running for <laughs> yeah. 17 years straight. Like, yeah. I mean, and I have my big boys, like I keep an extra hang on back, which is an AC 110, which is like, well, I can't even fit how big the filter is on the screen. <laughs> I, I know, keep yeah. an extra thing of media going on there. So if I'm ever starting a new aquarium or if I've ever had to medicate, I can jumpstart my, um, that aquarium, my biologic exactly. filter with that, you know, I've never, I've never been in the situation that I've I've had to use those products and I feel very strongly in that even if I'm offered money, I'm not going to recommend products just because Goodbye. if I don't have experience with them and I, I, I just can't really comment. I know he's a super smart dude. Tim Novak's you're a genius. Um, I have not had the need to use those products. For sure. That, that's a great answer. No, thank you. So I see from BM3 Aquatic uh, says, Rachel, I am a 60 year old woman that got back into the hobby two years ago. And I want to thank you for educating me and all you do. So I think that's awesome. It's never that's too awesome. late to jump back in. And this is a hobby notorious for sucking people, people back in. You know, you can, you can have multiple tank syndrome five or six times throughout your life, you know, true story, <laughs> uh, man. Let's see. Was I feel like I met oh, someone asked if my PO box is still active. It is. I check it like once a month. So if you're sending anything, you might want to let me know because I forget I have it until I pay for it. And then I show up and sometimes there's neat stuff and sometimes there's not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then we've got one from Adam Trisco that says, uh, any suggestions for a centerpiece fish that won't eat my shrimp? It's a 5.5. With a uh, nine ember tetra, two mountain minnows, a hill stream loach, and five pig cats. I don't know what pig cats are. I don't are. know. You're not going to like my that, answer. I think that's your a lot of fish for a yeah. stocked, and yeah. I don't believe in centerpiece fish. Yeah. So, yeah, that's kind Sorry. of. <laughs> same track answer if for your me tank too. makes you happy then you're doing the right thing i'm not telling you you're doing it wrong uh one of the biggest things i've learned from this hobby is no matter who you listen to there are eight thousand different ways to do every kind of aquarium and if it's working for you and it's managing and your your aquarium looks healthy and your fish are doing well then you're not doing it wrong and don't let anyone tell you that you are I just you want to do a million water changes. You, yeah, I would not encourage you to add more at this point. I would let it mature, see what's working, and then make decisions based on the experience of your aquarium. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a great answer. Let's see here. Um, does Rachel plan on doing live streams again? Says here, fishy. My so I can do live streams. The problem is, is when I try and do live streams in my actual fish room, the stream drops out. And I think it's because I have steel beams and steel racks and water just some, blocks a lot too, you know? Well, between the water and all the metal in my fish room, man, I was trying so hard during COVID times to do streams and they would just drop out and then I would have to restart them. And I felt like an asshole. You know, so I can do them like I have great success doing them here from my kitchen. Sure. Hey, but that's not really what people want to see. Um, and I just I haven't had good success otherwise. So if you guys want to see live streams from my kitchen, your girls you got know, you. I think they do, because I mean, you know, th <laughs> for me, this is unusual. I'm the same as you in that I wander around and just look in every tank while I'm talking and chatting. And people are like, I'm seasick. So I, I'm kind of like, to me, I'm like, well, if I'm live streaming, you want to see fish and not me. I'm just me. You can find a picture of me wherever. Um, 
But yeah, I think people would love to chat with you. Obviously, you have so much wisdom to share. Um, let's see here. Uh, there was another question. Um, just let me know if you need to cut this off at any time. And also, I did see that yeah, Joey. Yeah, I need to get out here. of here soon. I can hear my 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 children. Uh, yeah. Like whispering, "Are you done yet?" <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well, uh, there was one I saw that was, and it was actually a question that I'm curious about um, from Aquaballs, which is a guy in California, a friend of mine. He raises ball pythons and does a lot of fish breeding. Uh, but uh, George was asking. Um, if you unplug a hang on the back filter for a whole 24 hours, what's the best thing to do when you turn it back on or, or reincorporate it into your tank without, you know, spiking ammonia or um, is the bacteria going to be alive? The is bacteria gonna is dead? still going to be alive. Um, the colony may be slightly smaller. What I like to do when that happens, because I've had power outages here, is I like to just mm -hmm. pull the media out. Like if I... If let's say this is um, a power failure thing, the very first thing I do is take the media out, rinse it, and then just drop it in the tank. And then <laughs> when the power comes back, I put it back in the hang on back. But otherwise, basically, all I do is rinse out the mulm and put it back, and you should be good to go. Right on. Yeah, I think that's some great advice. I just saw another comment, and I, I'm just going to touch on it real quick, and then we'll wrap it up. But somebody did ask, uh, and you guys can leave comments on this video if you have more things to say in the yeah, future. Yeah, I'll check in, too. If you guys and, have, have uh, questions for me, I'll check into the comments as well. And somebody said they have a hard time seeing the color of uh, test tubes, like whether they're colorblind or, or I don't know what, what the issue is. But obviously, I mean, yeah, it's hard. Have a lot you of times, ever looked at those color cards? Ammonia looks like it's in every water it's test I've ever like, done. Oh my God, everything's going to die or totally yeah. fine. The gradient yeah. is like, that's why I'm so excited about this new product. And I yeah. really hope they make it available to the average consumer because yeah. literally it just gives you a readout like that. You can look at numbers. So freaking cool, man. So I'm going to, I'm going to get on their butts at API to like, make a consumer grade level of this because it's, it's it's insane i'm sorry to interrupt you but no 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 you're not interrupting <laughs> me ever i was gonna say uh just post it to an online you know facebook or forum group sometimes if you do have oh my god you're something. braver than me i would never do that <laughs> if you really can't tell any colors <laughs> that's what i would say but i mean i would honestly, turn it to a grayscale. I would, yeah. I would turn it to a grayscale. I would go into an editing program and turn it to a grayscale and compare grayscale to grayscale. That's what I would do before I would go That's to a, a fucking idea. Facebook. <laughs> and put it on like a white sheet of paper as right. your back. Yeah, probably. put it on a white can... sheet of paper, like a white sheet of paper behind it and do a grayscale and then you should be able to tell from the grayscale. That's a good idea. Yeah, yeah. Because if you hold it up, you know, or if your room has some green or brown, it's going to throw off the color. It's... <laughs> It's hard, but you know, thank you so much, Rachel, for coming on. I'm not worthy, <laughs> you know, thank oh, you for, for joining us and for chatting. I really appreciate it. And I'm glad to see you. Uh, I know for a little bit, there was a break. Everyone's kind of had a crazy year and sounds like you did too. Um, oh, but yeah. you mean, you look great now and you sound great. And, uh, thank you so much for, uh, spending some time with us today. And, uh, I just really appreciate it. Is there anything you wanted to finish up with? I'll let you have the last word on things. Yeah. I wanted to say thanks for your patience. You reached out to me quite a long time ago and I was like, dude, my life is a mess. Um, <laughs> sorry, not now. And you followed up and I'm, I'm glad we got to, and I, I hope that your audience has had fun with it. And you know, yeah. again, I'll, I'll be checking the comments. So if people have specific questions for me, I'm happy to try and answer. And I, I appreciate your time. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, thank you so much. Have a great night. And uh, thank you guys. Thanks for tuning in. Lurkers, uh, question askers, regulars, and new folks alike. Um, you know, check out Rachel's material, her website, if she's speaking near you in the near future. And uh, likewise on my channel, I've got, I don't know, 700 videos on all sorts of odd topics uh, if you're interested in the, the real nerdy stuff. So uh, yeah, have a great day, everyone. Thank you, Rachel. And uh, we're going to call it uh, now, but thanks, guys, and we'll talk to everyone later. All right. Bye.